at. Yes. Wonderful. Okay. Record to the cloud. That's what we want. Great. Okay. Well, again, we'll get started. We just admitted another person, uh, and that's fine. Uh, that'll work. Welcome to everybody for this fourth version of the, the No Code Data Science Workshop. Uh, as I mentioned a minute or two ago, I, I'm going to start with the uh, survey. I just think that uh, it it gives us information. There are times when we feel like we are uh, basically building the airplane as we fly it because the field is new. Uh, there's no perfect solution. There's no federal mandate that you learned data science or uh, AI. You know, when electronic health records came out, there was pretty much a mandate to create health informatics courses. There's no such mandate. So we're doing kind of the best we can, and we've upped our that we've upped our responses to 20. That's great. So I'll skip over the names of the people who did it. Uh, and I will send out another link. So the, the long and the short of it is a variety of ways people found out about it. Uh, I'm happy to say some previous attendees of the workshops are back. Uh, word of mouth worked pretty well, which is great. And, um, and LinkedIn. So, it, you know, we feel fortunate to have that uh, diversity of people coming from different directions for different reasons. Now, most of the people work in healthcare, like 90% and 85% are a clinician of some type, um, largely physicians, but not solely physicians. Uh, and again, most of the people responding have attended either a, the virtual workshop or listened to a recording. Uh, and most of the people have done at least three of, of whatever combination, but that's good news. Uh, and then again, most of the people looked at a recorded video. And then we wanted to ask, well, what, you know, really, was it helpful or very helpful? And most people thought that it was, in fact, helpful. Uh, most thought the content level was about right. We knew that for some, it would be too easy and for others, perhaps too difficult. Uh, we wanted to ask if people thought they would be interested in a follow-on uh, course, and they responded positively. We put a number on there of a proposed course, and again, a little over 50% uh, thought that it might be a workable uh, fee for them. And I did ask about a workshop dedicated to just AI, uh, and it, it wouldn't be one that would compete or interfere with the ABAIM uh, course, but it might be something unique on large language models or some other aspects. So that's, again, what we know from the survey. I'll send out another reminder, if you will. I did want to remind people of a couple of things. Number one, Many of us are involved with Anthony Chang's uh, Artificial Intelligence uh, Board Review Course, ABAIM. And if you want to know more about the uh, board review courses, just go to abaim.org. And that there's a second reason is he holds office hours every Wednesday at noon Eastern time for about an hour. Uh, it's usually 35 to 50 people joining from really literally everywhere. And many of them su subject matter experts. Some of them are kind of groupies. They're there every week. But the long and the short of it is there's a lot of expertise. You can bring your questions and other things uh, without a doubt. And so I, I think that I, I strongly recommend the office hours. There's no fee or, or prerequisite to go to office hours. But to get the email uh, and Zoom link, you need to apply on that website. All right, the second thing that I think is worthwhile that I've been doing a long time, uh, it, and that is the Medical Intelligence Society. That meets every uh, month. I think it's the fourth Tuesday. Uh, that doesn't sound right. Uh, or is it the second Tuesday? Sorry. Uh, but it meets at, again, it would be 4 o'clock Central, which is 5 o'clock Eastern, the first 45 to an, uh, minutes to an hour is AI, data science, a lot of interesting topics and a speaker. Anthony does what's hot in AI, real quick review. I do the data science tip of the month and there's a speaker. Then we have the second hour's medical 
uh, in, in uh, innovation, which is sort of biomedical engineering. In, in other words, what's hot out there that they produced uh, in terms of devices, genomics, you name it. Uh, and I think that uh, it basically, again, is an interesting way to keep up with stuff you may not know about. So let me try to copy. So in other words, to get the invitation and Zoom link, you have to fill out this registration. So let me copy it and put it in the chat for you. So if that sounds interesting to you, uh, that's the link to get it, okay? Now, Scott, you had a question, I think, about CME. Yeah, is there any way to finagle this into a CME bucket? Because I think it would really be beneficial to a lot of clinicians that have CME money. I know that's a lot of work. It might be too much heavy lifting, but I could see a lot of my colleagues really jumping into this as a as a as an entry to um, you know AI literacy. Just a thought. Not that you don't have enough work. Well, yeah, I mean, I'd have to check on that, whether it would have to be hosted by a university and whatnot. We've talked about this at length. I talked to Chandu at length yesterday, in fact. Um, so it, it's still a little bit up, up in the air in terms of where we go from here, other than the course that David's going to mention in a minute. Uh, in, in other words, I thought that I would do a free workshop three or four times a year like this and continue to tune it to, you know, it'll be easier because I already have the curriculum and whatnot. But if CME is an attractive thing, great. Uh, but again, we simply have not known what the need or demand is and by whom. We didn't even know if healthcare would be interested. Uh, and apparently that certainly was the domain that was most interested in this course. So. Uh, we need to fine tune that and please do email me or David or both of us with ideas of where you would like to see this go. Uh, but with that being said, actually, Dave, you want to you need your screen. To talk about the uh, Kettering course. Hey, hey, Bob, can I add one other thing about CME? Yeah. I know yeah. that's one of the weaknesses of of the of Anthony's yearly uh whatever we call that, the the grand meeting or et cetera. A lot of people came up to me and said they'd like to get CME. But again, that's not your bucket, but CME is really high on people's minds. Yeah, and in C, CEUs and there, I mean, there are other groups, but I mean, uh, CME is very important and I'd have to check to see what it takes to actually accomplish that. So I, I appreciate you bringing it up. Those are the kind of things I wanna hear about. I mean, I've considered what, what, whether some medical school would want to host us for a Saturday for six hours, you know, to teach a course that, you know, there, there are a lot of possibilities of how we might do this right now. We, we really are just talking about virtual courses. Dave, are you ready to talk about your future courses? Yes. Okay. Well, you, I need to stop share, I assume. Okay, so I see your screen. Which, uh, can you see the, uh, yeah, okay, I'm not allowed to share yet. It says host to see with participant screen sharing. You can see my screen? Yeah, well, I see, I don't see your screen. I actually see your image and your background. But I stop share. Is that another option under more, I wonder? Second. Host disabled participant screen sharing. Let me go under here. Let's see here. <clears throat> it makes no sense since you're a co host. Well, I could, I could talk through it until we figure out what's going on. Not that we waste okay. too much time. So, um, so yeah, let's, what, what's going on here with. Uh... <clears throat> so we have. I've I've I, I teach at three different graduate schools. One of them is Kettering University in Flint, Michigan. I've taught there for the last eight years, and um, 
we've been talking with them, Bob and I've been talking with them about, uh, you know, creating some classes based on our book through their, what they call Kettering Global University, which is, they, they have to have a grad, they have the graduate school, but they also have a professional training organization. And we've now agreed in a partnership with them. And what's interesting is they are very interested in rolling this out to the 68 hospitals in Michigan for a starter, and then going after the uh, doctors, uh, individual doctor practices also in Michigan. So that's very interesting. We're, we're talking with them. They have certain individual hospitals that are very interested in, in doing this. And so what we agreed on is uh, a May rollout of the next series of classes. And what those classes would be is what we call level one, which is what you're in right now. Today's the last day of a level one. We have a what we call level two intermediate class. And we have also a level three class, which uh, in its original, in its first original form was a 12 week form. And I'm finishing that up that class tomorrow, actually, we're going to end a 12 week level three class where we've gone through everything on high performance machine learning with orange predictive analytics and also high performance LLM AI prompts and some some really really exciting stuff that uh, we've been able to pull off there and uh, you know I'm, I'm pretty active in the consulting consulting business continuous improvement and other types of consulting and I've, I've found ways with LLMs to and to totally disrupt that world which is incredibly interesting and it's all about you know what kind of interesting Problems can you create? So, so let me jump into the topic. Uh, Scott was mentioning CMEs with Kettering. Bob and I have entertained the thought about CEUs, you know, continuing education units, and there's a long process for that. And we talked about that with uh, Kettering University, and as far as their professional development uh, section activity, they've decided not to pursue that because it was so incredibly painful and expensive. That was for them, they were telling us that it was, you know, $10,000 just to get started in the process. Now, what I don't know, Scott, is you mentioned CMEs. I'm only familiar with CEUs. I'm not familiar so, how similar those two topics are. So those are what for state licensing every two years, I'd just say California, you have to have as a physician, and I think as a DO also, you have to have um, 50 units, 50 hours of CME, continuous medical education. It's basically that. And there used to be a way to actually, a docs could aggregate and give a talk and it would count as CME. So there might be different pathways. I can, I'll sniff around a little bit. It's not my area of expertise for sure. And maybe, maybe some of the other docs here know, and, and, and then what the, requirements are for um, uh, nurses also and PAs and NPs, but we, we have to have them for state licensing and they're different in every state. I mean, they're different amounts required in each state, although they're cross applicable usually. So right. I can do a conference in Florida and it counts for California CME. That, that's basically it. Yeah, well, I, I will look at that, Scott. That's an excellent point. Yeah, but uh, you know, I'll get off the I'll get off the soapbox right now, but um, uh, you know when we talk to Kettering on this, they're telling us it takes a lot of time and a lot of effort. So, but we'll come back and look at this, the CME aspect of it and see what we come up with. And, and Dave, you might want to remind them that on the our website you have all the information there. Yes, if you go to uh, our, our our book website, nocodedatascience.net, and you go on the certification tab, you'll see a brochure that talks about our three level classes. And then also there's an individual PDF one pager you could download for each of the individual uh, level one, two, and three classes that are there. So we really encourage you to go further. If you found this interesting and you found this is an area that you wanna expand into, 
as sort of a collateral duty or an area of interest or subspecialty or however you want to view it. I strongly recommend that. We certainly, we'll be using the book more in that situation. But please go to the website and look at that. And oh, by the way, there's one other thing to look at under the resource tab. I just put a basically a compendium of 16 data science cheat sheets that you can download for free. Sometimes that's helpful. Sometimes in a cheat sheet, they'll phrase something that, that'll make you understand a complex topic, whereas a textbook would not. So there are, again, 16 data science cheat sheets that you can download that cover a variety of topics. Uh, anything else, Dave, you want to announce in that regard? Uh, no, not at this time. Okay, no. well, we think of something we can add to it. So that being said, let me, uh, let me I'm going to share back my screen and we'll get started with the actual content here. Okay, can you see this Google Doc? Okay. Yes. Okay. All right. So this first hour will be about model building. And what's important to me is that people actually understand the core concepts. And they really are core concepts. But before we even, let me start with saying, did anybody do the homework of creating something interesting in NHANES and wanted to share that? A any volunteers? Don't be shy if you did do it. But I can give you an example that I got interested in uh, grip strength, believe it or not, simply because all the studies show that muscle strength correlates with morbidity and mortality, meaning negatively correlated. The stronger you are, the lower your morbidity and mortality are. And I asked the question, well, isn't aren't pulmonary function tests the test of strength? diaphragm intercostal. And so they did correlate really very highly with grip strength, but then it occurred to me, well, wait a minute. Both of them are related to height, gender, and uh, age. So there, you could get fooled, but those are the kind of relationships you can tease out. Another one was, I tried to look at what correlates with a very high grip strength, and interesting enough, albumin and hemoglobin. You might go, you know, and again, it could be a red herring, but remember, as people get chronically ill or have an inflammatory condition, both the hemoglobin and albumin start to head, trend downward. So one of the signs of health really is a high hemoglobin or a very normal hemoglobin and normal albumin. But I'm saying there are tons of relationships there in the NHANES data. And I was talking to one of our participants about also, uh, looking at pediatric data, because when you look at some of the major data repositories, almost nothing there it, it includes pediatric data. Darren, you had a hand up. You want to uh, say something? Yeah, yeah so just um, myself and Anand had a quick look at um, ferritin um, levels. Um, we're a bit surprised to find a what seemed to be statistical difference between male and female levels of, uh, of ferritin. I thought I'd uh, just pull up the violin plot and see if that's actually what it's showing us or not. Um, am I able to do that or? Uh, could you no, do it today or sure, sure. I mean, uh, no, I'm sorry, just to share the actual image from it. So um, basically it's on the violin plot, it just looks like the uh, the the female kind of tail is quite flat. Um, and and the male is um, more grouped together um, at the bottom. There's a, a larger outlier that you can see in the male um, side, but yeah, I mean it, it appears like there there is a statistically significant, um, slightly higher level of ferritin in males than females. I mean that may not represent disease; it might just be a uh, a difference in gender generally. Yeah, it, number one, it's an acute phase reactant, but I, that's so it can go up with inflammation. But number two, they usually say 
in women, the iron level ferritin and others should be lower because of the menses when they were younger. But that was another thing, interesting that you brought that up. Uh, when I had a lot of NHANES data, I was very curious about hemochromatosis in adults because it's often overlooked. So I, I basically started by screening everybody with an elevated ferritin. Then I looked at iron binding capacity. And, and the long and the short of it was, I was fairly convinced that there are plenty of adults out there with hemochromatosis that are, are silent, that have not developed any end organ uh, abnormalities uh, other than the iron you know, abnormalities. And that that's one of the things a study like NHANES would pick up. So that's just an aside, but but those are the kind of things I think are important looking at. Or in pediatrics, I noticed that they started liver uh, stiffness tests, fibro scans at age 12. So that means I think there was something like three or 4,000 and, and we're just admitting a pediatrician. I'll, I'll let her get uh, situated here. Uh, but one of the thoughts would be, wow, there's a lot of interesting studies because Certainly, uh, there is a lot of maturity onset diabetes of youth, obesity, lack of activity, you name it. But with NHANES data, you could really paint quite a comprehensive picture of, say, an overweight 16-year-old uh, who already has fatty liver, who already has dyslipidemia and metabolic syndrome. Uh, it, it would be easy to accumulate data on such a subgroup. And that's why I'm really preaching that people try to take advantage of this wealth of information that's in NHANES. So that's something I've posed to Martha Helms at UVA, who's a pediatrician and also is involved with uh, clinical informatics. Uh, Brian, you had a comment? Um, are you able to enable screen share for the participants? That's a good question. <laughs> There, um, there should be something that says security on your panel at the lower uh, Zoom functions. And under that, it will say enable screen sharing. All right, because I've got it under more, there's a lot. Let's see. Uh, there's one that says security. Usually the host has that. I just wanted to show, I'm trying to knit together a poor man's metabolic syndrome data set from NHANES. And I didn't get very far, but I got a little ways. And okay. I thought I might just show it. Yeah, if I can figure out, I mean, because that was basically the homework assignment to do just what you're doing. Uh, when I click screen share, it says host disabled participant screen right, well, share. Let me, let me do this. Let me stop sharing. Okay. You want to try it now? Okay, let's see. Now it still says it's disabled. All right, it's let a, me look at Dave, you any ideas? There should be a badge, an icon that says, I think it says security at the bottom of the Zoom tray. I do, I do see security, yes. Click that and the options, one of them should say enable participant screen sharing or something like that. Does it, does it have a pop-up menu? Allow participants to share screen. There you go. Okay, <laughs> it should allow, so in, in, in all fairness, and Darren should be able to show us the violin plot too. Yeah, that's kind of where I was going. So um, here's the workflow uh, so far. And um, I learned two things. One of them is minor and one's a little more significant. I kept getting wrapped around the axle trying to drag these kind of coming down this diagonal cascade. If you can see my cursor as I scroll, trying to put them all into one merge data. And then I discovered yep. that orange allows you to only do them two by two, uh, and right. then the output of the merge data is data. So then I could merge another one, and then another one, and then another one, and do it all on the seek number, uh, you know, to pair it together. So the final That's output right. is, is this table here. And where I was going, not all of these are perfect. Um, so don't, <laughs> don't get too <laughs> in the weeds with me here, but I've got, you know, the demographics, the body measures, trying to look at, you know, body habitus, these folks fasting glucose, glycohemoglobin, and the triglyceride and LDLs, and then uh, insulin and CRP levels. There's some suggestion that, you know, obesity creates this general inflammatory 
syndrome. Right. And I know high sensitivity is a cardiac measure. You know, it's not really fit for purpose for this, but the whole point of the exercise, you know, was to have fun with data, try to look to see. So I didn't get any analysis yet, but the uh, um, data set knitted together uh, came out well. It's got, um, what does it say, 31 features, lots of missing data. So my and next step will be to go in on each of those threads feeding in, I think is how I do it, Bob, uh, on, you know, body measures and stuff and put up a, a missing data node in here to address it is that correct yeah well let me backtrack though remember one of the problems is you've got you've got actually a category of zero to 24 months in there uh, and there's literally don't don't quote me like 2000 infants or whatever and so you've got children infants teenagers and adults and and yeah. the elderly all in that data set so i think Personally, I don't. I think you you ought to pick an age group and go with that. Yeah, I'm going to do that. That's part of it, and part of my learning process in Orange is how to uh, either bin or uh, exclude. You know, data below whatever. Yeah, well, years. the easiest way is after that demographics, just insert a, a select rows widget, and then just oh, okay. say, uh, subjects over age. Uh, whatever you decide. Okay. But the reason I'm, I'm mentioning that is a tremendous amount of your missing data is because they're not going to do a lot of these tests in infants. I mean, that's so right. Once you yeah. cl clean it up to a, a say just adults, a lot of the missing data will go away. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I appreciate the guidance, and I, I was worried too. The cascade here in the lower left, I'm hovering. It's fifteen thousand six hundred. I was afraid after all of these that I would end up with, you know, 200 <laughs> patients out of the group, but uh, we'll see as I start uh, doing some of the work no, you're we'll, talking about. Well, keep me posted afterwards. I'm happy to follow with you. Okay. So you get sort of a polished product that you're proud of, and then you can turn around and mine it a little bit, but this is precisely what I was talking about. And so Brian, I appreciate you showing that. That one minor thing I'll show just briefly is I found that when you pull up, uh, you know, like this is the body measures yeah. table here. When you're looking to tell which variables you want to skip or include, this may be just something that's quirky to working in uh, orange, not quirky, but good. Uh, I found that if I came to the NHANE site and um, clicked on the doc, and then come back to orange. This is just to help people. And then click on that little table I brought up. I could have the table here on the right and then scroll down this document and read about the variables and decide if I wanna keep them or not. And then just jump right over to this panel and click skip or not. It's, it's kind of a dual workflow on a single screen. I thought that was kind of cool. It yeah, saved no, a lot of back and forth. That's a time saver. And remember what Scott said, you can also use select columns. You, you can do either. In other words, you can have select rows and select columns. Columns, you will get, you will basically not include the ones you're skipping here. You can do either. Yeah, yeah. So yep. anyway, I, I just think though, that's a great example of what I'm talking about. But you could do the same as I was mentioning in pediatrics. I wanna see every uh, kid age 12 to, 20 that has evidence of liver stiffness and I want to study them. It's just one example. Yeah. Darren, yeah. You want to, Darren did you want to uh, try to share your screen for the violin plot? Sure. Yeah. I put it in the chat just before, but I can, I can show you very quickly. Oh, okay. the work, but, to my uh, knowledge, the ferritin should be higher in men. Sure. Yeah. I mean, it well, it may well be just, uh, just that. Am I showing the right bit of the screen? I think we're seeing you. Yeah. Uh, so this was just using the same um, workflow as before, but just taking the ferritin variables and merging them. Uh, so the data table looked like this. I think ferritin, uh, the two uh, different values are just different units, but they're exactly the same uh, value. Um, and then the violin plot was this uh, this shape. Yeah. And so how did you interpret that? So, well... I actually looked at the box plot first, and that seems to show clearly there's a bigger outlier on the 
than males. Um, but it seems to be statistically significant that males have a generally higher ferritin level than females um, who are actually a tighter group. Um, and I presume that the violin plot is is showing that similar kind of distribution in the in the width of this. Clearly, there's an outlier in the in the males up here. Um, but yeah, I presume that's what that is indicating on the violin plot. Is that right? Yeah, when it, it shows a wider distribution for sure. Yeah. And it shows some probable outliers. You'd have to look at it statistically. But but again, that's good exploration. That's the beauty of visualization of doing just what you did. So thanks for sharing that. All right. If you'll stop sharing, I guess you have to do that. And I'll share my screen. Okay. So, and Dave, if you'll look at the chat to be sure I'm not overlooking anything. Uh, let's get started, though, on actual model building. I put this diagram here just to confirm that all of us love the new and exciting and sexy things, large language models, that a new one comes out every day. But the reality is, if you're in data science and AI, you're going to be doing kind of the stuff on the right. And I want to emphasize very strongly that your clinical expertise is super important because most data scientists have very little training in medicine. And therefore, they don't know what's important and what's not. And that's what you point out. Even when we looked at that weird data set last week of diabetes uh, prediction, it took some clinical know-how to go, this is not right. And so the the clinical domain matched with somebody who's very knowledgeable about statistics and data science is a great combination, but you certainly need both for any data project. I want to go through again concepts here that first of all, some people use models and algorithms as equals. We don't. We think that the model is the big thing. I, I put down here that like a model is a chocolate cake. The algorithms are the recipes. So basically, you know, we do not equate the two. We use them separately. Now, another concept, the, you'll see model parameters. Those are things that are intrinsic to the model itself, like the coefficients and linear regression, whereas model hyperparameters are things you can tweak or adjust, which we're not, unfortunately not going to demonstrate very much in this class as a beginning class. But David has done a lot of work in this. And Orange, if we have time, we'll show you how to dynamically look at what happens when you tweak something. In Orange, you can actually see it real time adjust the performance of a model. So parameters, hyperparameters are different. We're only going to talk about supervised learning Unsupervised learning could be an entire course, more complicated, high yield, but difficult. Classification is the most common type of supervised learning, particularly categorical. It means it fits in a category, such as developed COVID, didn't develop COVID, uh, lived or died, and so forth. And uh, generally, again, the outcome is binary by sort of tradition, but it doesn't have to be. It could be multiple classes that you're trying to predict, like a low ejection fraction, intermediate and high, or normal rather. And a regression model, so you understand, is when the outcome is numerical, length of stay, hospital course. Or what if you wanted to predict somebody's uh, hemoglobin A1C? That would be a regression model. All right, the next concept I want to go over is, and it's not mentioned a whole lot, but it should be, is almost everything we've done and we're talking about today would be model discrimination. And that, and I'm gonna flip down to this diagram, which I think says it all. Model discrimination basically, particularly with a binary classification is how well does it differentiate the two classes? Here it shows healthy and sick, could be heart disease, no heart disease, makes no difference. The beauty of showing you like this, showing you two dis distributions, in the real world, there's some overlap. 
So if the healthy spills over into the sick, that's a false positive. Conversely, if, if sick spills over into healthy, that's false negative. So I hope you can see how the overlap is why in when you look at two populations like this, and this is the distribution, there's overlap. And understand this threshold, we're gonna look at that being dynamic. When you look at the receiver operator curve, that's set at 0.5, just for convenience or, or tradition. We can shift it. We can change it to our favor. And I, so we'll go over that in a minute. But I want you to understand model discrimination is does it discriminate between two classes in a binary situation? But wait, there's more. There's also model calibration, which is rarely commented in any article, unfortunately. And actually, Orange has the ability to uh, tweak calibration. And what calibration is all about, and I brought up the calibration widget in orange to show you in a minute when we get to that, it's all about predicted probability, not does it fit in one bucket, uh, like we just showed you, bucket healthy, bucket sick, but what about the probabilities? If it predicted one, was it did it really predict one or was it 0.8 or 0.7? And if, if you put all of the predicted probabilities, what you're going to get is like this. This is an unbelievably good curve because notice this green line is really close to the 45. So that if the predicted probability was 0.5, you go up here to the line, you go over to the left, it is 0.5. That's darn good calibration. So that's a second aspect of modeling. We're not really going to cover, but I sure as heck wanted you to know about it. Scott, go ahead. I also wanted to add that be careful that you, or be clear that you understand the distribution shape. Uh, not everything's normal. So you could have some, these two curves could have skew to one side or the other, and that's also going to change your model up, right? So it's just an understanding of what the, of what the distribution is, of what you're trying to draw the, the boundaries in. That That's all. Because um, in healthcare, so much is assumed that it's, normally distributed but of course you know things like hodgkins is either by there there are 50 different kinds of distribution curves so it's just a point yeah well, thanks scott another one that's not in here that i meant to add right along that same line is when we look at things like regression we assume that we're dealing with a linear model that x and y are really closely related like let's say height and weight and and they are fairly closely related but some things in medicine are not are nonlinear. That that curve or that line becomes actually a curve. Dave, you want to comment on that because Orange has a polynomial classification regression widget where you can actually look at what the best curve is. Go go ahead, Dave. If you've got a comment. Yeah, you know I've been um, analyzing industry data for probably thirty plus years, and it's rather interesting in sixty different industries that. 97% of the data that I look at is not normal. There are some industries like call centers. When I teach classes for them, statistical analysis, whatever it might be, they actually ask me to take the examples of normal distribution out of the training materials because they do not exist in a call center. <laughs> so it's, it's not just medical has problems with not having that normal data. Non-normal data is very common in in any industry. And the beauty of all the algorithms that you know Bob's going to start to talk about now within Orange is that we have a, a large group of the algorithms. They don't care if it's not normal. They could they could deal with that as far when it comes to the predictive analytics. Okay, thanks. So yeah, that we'll talk about the importance of having multiple algorithms not relying on just one. There are people, if you're a statistician, you probably say I've used logistic regression my whole life, it works great. Or if you're a new you know, machine learning guy or woman, you might say, I use XGBoost, it, it, it play, you know, beats all the competition in uh, data contest. Neither answer is right, we use them all. Uh, so let me start with number seven. You'll see the term model validation, which sounds like proving whether the model is good or bad. No, 
It simply is, does the model perform on data it has not seen before? That's what model validation is. And in point of fact, there's really internal and external validation. Look at the little diagram down here that I have my cursor on. Train and test. You took a data set that you got somewhere and you may have split it 75, 25, let's say in the train and test, but that's internal validation. That's, that's the same data as opposed to what if you then, your test data came from across the street at a different facility or a different time period, or it's a prospective study. You finished your model. Now you want to test it on brand new people that are admitted to the hospital, let's say. That would be really a, another way, sort of external data the model is not seen. And also to make things a little bit more confusing, but I'm going to tell you, is plenty of people will say, well, we'll, we'll throw in a third way of splitting this. We'll have a validation data set. And then some of them use validation and test data set uh, uh, interchangeably, which we think is clearly a mistake. But why would you say split it 60% train, 20% validation and 20% test? The reason is, is let's say you are going to adjust the algorithms. You're going to tweak a neural network for its maximum performance. And you do that with that small validation uh, uh, data set, in other words. And then when you're done tweaking, then you would test it on the test data set, okay? This is an area of tremendous confusion, unfortunately. So this is, again, this first diagram is just basically showing you what would happen if you'd split it into say roughly 75, 25. That's kind of what it would look like. All right, now there's another term cross validation, which is important. And it can have different numbers of K, five or 10 or two common numbers. And let me scroll down there and show you a little bit about that. You see the first thing it says all data. Now they split it into training and test. Now they're gonna take the training data and, and put it in five buckets, if you will. And so in the first, they're gonna train on the on folds two, three, four, and five and test on one. The next go around, they're gonna uh, train on one, three, four, and five and test on two and so forth until all of the folds have been used for test. Then they may turn around and do it three or four more times. But the long and the short of it is they'll average the performance and that'll be your training performance. I know that's confusing. And then so you get a training performance, let's say an AUC of 0.8, and then you test the model on test data it is not seen. And that will be your final and most important test uh, result will be on your test data. And in the classification regression model, I'm going to show you, we did split it into train and test. Again, another thing that's a little hard to understand is that you generally, and that's why it's called a holdout data set. That test data set, you're supposed to put it on the sidelines and not touch it. You can tweak the training data, but you don't touch the test data. Another core concept is the idea of overfitting. I mean, you can also have underfitting. Underfitting is when it really doesn't match the two classes, red and blue here at all. Proper fitting is it takes into account uh, the, the distribution and location pretty well. Overfitting is it's trying a little too hard to match everything. And that's the problem. I think you can understand why a simple decision tree is guilty of this. Because if you keep allowing it to split, 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 it's going to try to make sense out of the signal, the important early stuff, as well as the noise. And so when it does that, it overfits. And how do you know that? Because it performs well on the training data, but on the test data, it's far worse. So that, and that's fairly typical. You would expect the test performance in general to be slightly worse, if you will. All right, as I mentioned, we're going to go ahead and go over a classification regression model. Let's go over some of the algorithms. We probably will have a brief break between the two sessions. Please understand that we're not going to demonstrate all the algorithms, nor are we going to go in great detail in this kind of beginning course. But I do think some understanding of things like simple linear regression, 
Simple linear regression is Y happens to be your savings. That's on the Y axis. That's your outcome. Your X is the number of weeks you've worked. This is just an example. This could be height or weight, you know, after all. So you develop the model and you try to basically insert a regression line to, to kind of match or fit these data points the best that you can, okay? But it's never gonna be right on this line. You can see these data points are above or below. You consider that positive or negative, but the point, those are called residuals or errors. And you can see it is an error. It's not perfect. It's not right on the line, but it creates a formula. If you wanna calculate savings or why, you take the intercept, which is 400, plus what amounts to be the slope, which is 307.5 weeks and or times weeks. And so in the example I gave is, okay, if that's true, let's plug in six weeks. All right, so saving at six weeks is 400 plus 307 times six, $245. So that's how this simple linear regression works. You go up six weeks, you go over, and it's roughly $225. Now that's simple. Now you also have an R value. And this kind of is goodness of fit. This is how well that line fits the data, if you will. And ironically, if you square it, you get one of the outcome measures you're also interested in regression called R squared. So uh, we'll get into that in a minute. Scott, you had a comment? Oh, before you go to logistic, I just wanted you to comment on a really important form of regression, linear regression, that's multiple regression. So if, I, if I'm using my zip code to predict my the price of my house, but I go to a multiple regression model, I add things like square footage, how close to a school, how many bathrooms, any other multiple variables can still predict the number, which is a lot of what we do in in, in medicine, predict a number, predict a class. But I just I just wanted to comment on that. You don't go deeply, but it's very powerful. Yeah, thanks, because that really should have been a, a, a sub note here or whatever is that. So this is a simple linear regression. You get simply got X and Y, but the reality is you would normally have, like Scott says, and uh, that you have a housing data set in your file widget where you're trying to predict housing costs on the left, the, the Y axis, and this is not a simple linear regression, it's multiple linear regression where you have multiple predictors, if you will. It, you'd have to demonstrate multiple linear regression in a, multiple planes. That's why I studiously avoided it. Trying to explain that in an image is next to impossible. But in the real world, you would have multiple predictors, not just one X. So thank you for bringing that up. That is, that is obviously true. All right, logistic regression is to me interesting because it's been around a long time. And in medicine, we used to publish odds ratios off of logistic regression. That's pretty much the, the coin of the realm is what you went by. Uh, but the whole idea of it is though, it predicts two classes, a one and a zero, but it gives the probability of it. So it, it it's often not going to be one. It'll be, in this case, you see 0.8. Down here, it's not zero, it's 0.20. And you could really theoretically plot all of these on this sigmoid curve. So it predicts probabilities. And I, I'm going to show that with the prediction uh, widget when we get to that, that in just a few minutes. But so logistic regression is used for classification only. You can tweak it. Again, it's kind of above the uh, level of this you know, beginner course, but there are ways to make it even better. Something called regularization basically penalizes the weak actors. It's like benching people in a football team that didn't play well. You, you bench them and you bring in somebody that's stronger with higher coefficients, if you will. Uh, but we won't get into that, but it is important. And I think that uh, that's one of the benefits of an intermediate course when you get into some of practical, not hard to understand things to make the algorithms work better. Scott? Well, and I think it's important for, I think it's important to understand as let's just say in healthcare, where you, where that dotted line, where you move it back and forth is completely a function of what you're trying to classify, right? So 
if you are trying to build an HIV test that, uh, you know, is discriminating HIV, not HIV, your false positive, false negative, each have really important uh, outcomes versus I'm just going to predict somebody who's not going to show up to an appointment next week, right? So I think in healthcare, just understanding, moving, moving around, moving around the boundaries of what, what is acceptable for you. A lot of people just don't think about that when they build a classifier. Okay. Well, I'm going to show that with this interactive uh, receiver operator curve, that threshold of changing the positives and the negatives in just a minute. All right, decision trees, I think we went over last week. It uses a mathematical algorithm called an information gain, the same thing that you see in the rank widget to calculate where it should split first. It's very intuitive, but again, the, what you need to understand, it does tend to overfit. It can, it can handle, though, nonlinear data. So that's one of the advantages, and that tends to be true of the newer algorithms, the newer machine learning algorithms. They can handle... Uh, linear uh, relationships and nonlinear relationships. Now, the next two categories that I'm going to sort of lump together is random forest and boosting. Remember, when you have gradient boosting widget and you open it, you actually have four choices. Mine is set on XG boost, but you've got cat boost, you've got several others. But what I want you to understand is they came about these two differently that really make pretty good sense, I think. One is parallel reasoning or crowdsourcing. The other one is sequential. Let's scroll down. But think of the word random forest, forest, lots of trees, random. They basically select bits and pieces of a model for these different models, and then they average them, and they go with that. That's why I say it's crowdsourcing, and it's parallel, whereas boosting is sequential. They figure out the model, then they go ahead to the next model. They, you know, they improve upon it and they keep improving upon it sequentially. So that's boosting as opposed to bagging. One's parallel, one's sequential. I honestly, at this point, don't think you need to know more about that. They do have a lot of good attributes. I mean, logistic regression is still great if your data set's pretty clean not a whole lot of missing data, pretty normally distributed, not a whole lot of outliers and whatnot. Some of the newer ones are more forgiving. I think that's all you need to understand. But the long and the short of it is, if you create a model, you're going to throw in tons of them. And I'll explain a little bit more about that with something called no free lunch theorem. Uh, and you'll see what I mean by that in a minute. And then I threw one out that is interesting that Dave and I only recently recognized called CN2 rule induction. It's old, not new. It's like around the time of trees. You can use it for classifying like any of the others to predict something, but it also will create if-then rules. You know, for instance, uh, and, and so it's, it's trying to basically create an if-then rule for one or zero. So it could be like if you're trying to predict diabetes and it says, if the patient is female and Asian, and their BMI is less than 20, they are a zero, and then it gives a 90% chance versus a 10% chance. We'll see that in action in a minute. Okay, so we'll go over, what I think we'll do is we'll go ahead and take a five minute break, and then we'll come back, and then we'll go over the workflow, and we'll start talking about the evaluation of a model. So let's take about a five minute break. And Dave, if you want to present your prompting as we start back up, that would be great. Sure. Bob, do you want to, we should probably cause, pause the recording? Yeah, let me just see. Uh... For the break. Yeah, I'm just looking though. I see stop video. I want that's not I want to pause that. video. Right. And that's what I'm looking for. I don't see that setting. Oh, I see pause. Right. No, that's pause share though. No, there is recording. Looks like I can resume recording. Dave, are you ready to talk about your unusual way of prompting? 
Uh, yeah, so let me just first of all try to get my uh, video going on here again. Bear with me. Okay. You want me to stop share? Yeah, let's see if I could share. I had a problem last time. Let's see if I could get that to share. I'm now seeing your screen. Okay, great. All right. So, yeah, welcome back, everybody. So, um, what I'm going to show you is some materials that um, I started on the second to last class for uh, the level three, and then I'm going to finish up tomorrow. And it's a fascinating topic. First of all, if you get all the way up to that point in our classes, you will learn two different things that overlap with each other. You will learn how to do very high performance modeling in orange. And we actually practice on Kaggle data competitions uh, with, with students. And then we also show how to do very high performance prompting using uh, large language models, GPT-4 to be very specific. And I'll just show you just a few of these intro slides here. And there's there's a lot of work that I've done there. And then keep in mind, my background is a continuous improvement specialist, a Lean Six Sigma Master Black Belt, as well as uh, doing you know a lot of numerical analysis for many, many years. So this is what we've come up with. We have this, and I'm going to apologize for looking over at one of my other screens, but when you try to look at, all right, here I am in doing predictive analytics, but what do I do when I'm trying to actually pursue industry 4.0? That's a very big topic that we cover in ch uh, chapter 12 of our book. When you talk about industry 4.0, which is digital integration, which is you know the, the real-time analysis of multimodal data, the world gets rather interesting at that point, and we start to talk about that. But what's very interesting from my background when you come to that point is you shouldn't even be allowed to look at that area unless your business is efficient and has a lot of, you know, the waste is eliminated. I've seen too many people try to build a very sophisticated model, business model on top of a, an incredibly uh, poor performance where customers are unhappy, that's not that's not very useful. So what I was experimenting with, and when I say experimenting, I mean some pretty wild experiments here that I'll talk about in a little bit here, is how do you actually combine and these two techniques that I'm talking about, high performance predictive modeling in orange and high performance AI prompting. They do and can work together. And what's interesting about this whole scheme is that uh, we've come up with a, at least a working title for that right now. I like to call it AICI, which is AI powered continuous improvement. Because when you're doing prompting, you got a very interesting world in front of you that you could take advantage of. And so if you look at this pyramid, and you know, there's not just a few different steps in the pyramid. There's very, very many. You know, AI can really accelerate the path to industry 4.0. And I'll show you some top level examples, what I've been going through with uh, our level three class. And, you know, but again, the first thing you want to take advantage of and do inside of your organization is not just take an organization that ticks off every customer and every patient, and then say, oh, yeah, I want to go to AI. I want to go to uh, Industry 4.0. No, no, no. You have to, first of all, take care of your, your efficiency uh, situations, your waste in the organization, and then before you move on to the Industry 4.0. That's pretty important to understand. Once you understand that that's really how you should approach <laughs> moving toward Industry 4.0, there are six major steps that we like to talk about, but in between there's many dozens of steps. And if you, you start with looking at 
you know, what's the data that you have? What's your, you have to start out with your, your problem definition of your business, the data foundation. You have to address the waste and inefficiency and customer dissatisfaction. And the beauty with large language models is what we show people is upload a description of the situation analysis for your business. And we like to use a um, bad day at the office for <coughs> for this example. It's a really bad day at a doctor's office. We upload those two pages to the LLM. And we also upload a, a, a similar data set of how long it takes for certain patients to work their way through the doctor's office. And you would not believe what you could do with uh, the, <laughs> the 40 very detailed prompts that I happen to use. You could take that situation and with prompting, and this will be my last slide, by the way, where I talk about AICI, GPT analysis prompts, if you actually include all of these techniques that are shown here as individual prompts, and you could actually turn your large language model into a very high performance, very expensive consulting firm. And trust me, I've been involved very often and continue to be involved with consulting firms that charge an arm and a leg to to go into organizations and help to fix them. But what I've tried to do in the last few weeks is say, can I actually disrupt the industry that I've actually been very active with in the last 24 years? And the answer is not only yes, but hell yes. And you would not believe, uh, and I don't have the time to show you this, but I could show you that, that what, I, what I would show my class tomorrow is, with just a two-page description of your business and by using over 40 intelligent prompts. Oh, by the way, these prompts, you don't just whip them out. You you go back and forth with the LLM and say, do you like this prompt? You can then create a 50-plus page consulting report that starts out, they'll get this, with an executive summary. And each of those pages and each of the analysis techniques would typically take one to two hours for any team of consultants to work that out. So um, what I'm telling you is that we have not only done some interesting prompt engineering, but we found ways how to take some very super sophisticated analysis and bring that down to a level for small organizations where that they could actually afford to do this on their own. Obviously, you need to understand a lot of the techniques and the terms that you see on this page. So you need to have somebody that understands a lot about continuous improvement. But this is an incredibly disruptive technique that we are fine tuning. And uh, I talked, uh, we had, uh, you know, last Saturday with my level three class, we talked about it and we'll finish that topic uh, tomorrow. So I'll get off that soapbox, Bob. Thanks, Dave. I, I hope you all can see the, the significance of this, uh, how this would save uh, weeks of time and therefore lots of dollar bills, too. Uh, let me see if I can share my screen. But I just thought you should see the kind of work David is doing. He's taken a lot of things, including Orange, to an entirely different level, if you will. And I'm really proud to be a part of that, if you will. All right, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the two workflows and then I'm going to get back to talking about some of the outcomes about how do you evaluate a model. Uh, so this is the classification and here's the heart disease prediction that's already in uh, the file widget. It takes things like the type of chest pain, the EKG, maximal heart rate, which probably means on the treadmill, uh, ST, uh, depression by exercise, Major vessel colored, by the way, for the non-clinician means how many are calcified. There's, that's that's a negative. If you, you have several coronary arteries that they can see calcium in, that's a sign of what they used to say 50 years ago, hardening of the arteries. It's not a good thing. Let's put it that way. And thal does not stand for thalassemia. It stands for thallium stress test. It's a heart scan you do with a treadmill test to see if there's any reversible lack of blood supply, so to speak. 
But those are the standard risk factors. Everybody had cardiac catheterization. If they had greater than 50% coronary stenosis, they were labeled heart disease, less than 50, no heart disease. Obviously, that's not completely satisfactory, but it is what it is. All right, so the question is, okay, let's take this more seriously. We now want to split this into train and test. This is set on 70. We can make it 75, if you will, or thereabouts, 75, 25. We hit sample data. I will show you something. Orange is almost always right. In this one case, it's always wrong. If you want to set up these signals for test and train, this is what it should look like, but that is an out of the box. That, that's not what happens. So data sample goes to data, remaining data goes to test data. I think it's pretty logical, but this does not automatically occur. So you need two connectors from data sampler to test and score. So we'll leave this maybe there for a little while. Here's rank, which is an overall rank. It's not the rank for just logistic regression. So what most of these show is the thallium stress test is the most predictive, followed by the kind of chest pain. And there again is that major vessels colored, which means calcified. So I'll, I'm not going to go then any further. I think it was Scott, if I'm not mistaken, wanted me to show feature importance. And let me comment for a few of these to take a look at what's going on. You have to not only connect to an algorithm, but you need to connect it back to the data itself. Notice for the tree, I had to do that in order to see the tree over here, the tree viewer. For the CNN rule induction, I had to also take it back, just so you, you understand. That's a little different than, say, just logistic regression. You just connect that to test and score. So, uh, all right, well, let's go ahead and look at these. The tree you've already seen, uh, you want to see the tree viewer, of course. And you notice it's split on thallium and it goes down major vessels, blah, blah, blah. Uh, you've seen that before. I'm not going to go over that. Logistic regression, you do have some choices. You can play with it yourself. As I mentioned, you can have no regularization. You can have ridge or lasso. And that just basically is pen penalizing the, the weak actors is what it's doing. But you never know exactly what's going to happen, uh, oddly enough. In other words, you might say, well, logistic regression has got to be better if you add lasso or ridge. Nope. There are times. I mean, I jokingly one, I told one class that I should be adult diaper salesman because I use the word depends constantly. In other words, you often, when you look at a, a situation, a, an algorithm and a data set, you would, you would say, oh, I think logistic regression is going to work best. Well, it just sort of depends. Uh, and without testing a bunch of algorithms and a bunch of performance metrics, you really don't know for sure what's going to perform best or not. All right, Bob, you should, Bob, you should show Dave's screenshot of what he runs a model and then he leaves his computer for a night <laughs> and then he comes yeah. back. He's got, he's, I mean, it's unbelievable, but it's- Yeah, really if we have time, we'll do that because I think, he, Dave, you were up to 2,500 permutations. Is that right? Um, Actually, well over 4,000, but who's counting? Yeah, okay. That's above my pay grade. <laughs> Makes my it makes my head dizzy thinking about it. Uh, but so the point is, if you went into each one of these and you tweaked them, you can get some mileage out of that. So this is random forest. The number of trees, I mean, for instance, uh, so you can adjust it. Some you can adjust more. I don't have neural network here, by the way. Uh, that has lots of adjustments, if you will. I think Scott wanted me to show you one I really like. When you want to look about what the model is seeing was if you uh, go ahead and download the explain module, which is that one over here, in there is something called feature importance or permutation feature importance. And what that does, what I like about it is fairly logical. What it does is it shuffles a predictor. Let's say, you know, you got heart disease here. It shuffles thallium 
and, and it screws up the the, the uh, relationship between thallium and say the outcome. It shuffles the data, and you notice the model deteriorates severely. It must mean that thallium is awfully important. Well, then it goes through all the uh, basically the predictors uh, and shuffles them. And you can pretty well decide what's important or not. In other words, if shuffling a predictor like blood pressure doesn't change the outcome of the model, it must not be very important. So that being said, let's open it up and take a look. First of all, you have to pick what kind of score for a balanced data set like this one is, meaning you have about as many heart disease as not heart disease. You would use either AUC or accuracy probably. And so, and you can tell, you can set the number of permutations here and you can limit it to top 10 features or let's make it actually five, whoops, five. So you can see the thallium here was the leading one followed by major vessels, colored or and chest pain and so forth. So what we like about it is easy to explain. Some of the model explainers, like something called SHAP, S-H-A-P, SHAP or SHAPLY, there are times when I can't figure out what it means. Uh, sometimes it's clear, sometimes it's not clear. I would say feature importance is always pretty intuitive. And notice there are times when maybe, and we'll be talking about this in a minute, you want to look at Matthew's co uh, correlation coefficient instead. And so it's calculating right now, let's see what it considers. Because it's gonna look at people with heart disease and people without heart disease, but it will give feature importance. And so it did the major, the coronary vessels calcified first and thallium set, but notice how close they are. But this one is a nice one. So is rank if you're trying to see what's important. Uh, Scott, you had a comment? Oh, I was saying this is really important when, especially now that we're getting into things like social determinants of health, because it allows you to not have any bias or any assumptions about what may or may not be important to, let's say, a, a health outcome. And so it allows you to challenge your, you know, your prior views. I mean, in, in terms of putting it in the model, it may, we may assume something's really important on a social determinant, which is, which is critical to understand, but if the model doesn't show it adds any improvement, you have to start questioning that. And the other thing I would is, could you just mention PCA real quickly, principal component analysis, how that's different? Yeah, well, that's unsupervised learning where, you, and it's also dimension reduction, meaning sometimes you have data that has a, a ton of predictors. Let's say it's a data set of 200 patients and that you, you have 100 predictors. That creates some problems. It would be better to reduce than shrink and simplify the model. So using an unsupervised learning technique called principal component analysis, it's like a data trash compactor. It will reduce the number of predictors to something that's manageable, and you still can use it to predict the model. But that's called principal component analysis or PCA. We won't cover that in this beginning course, but that's unsupervised learning. Uh, okay, so gradient boosting is important, but let me just get, so you understand that this uh, choices here, uh, I chose XG boost. Uh, gradient boosting is kind of what Python comes out of the box, in other words. Uh, this is a, a little bit hard to explain uh, I'm, I'm going to skip over that. I think I would confuse you. CAT boost, the CAT stands for category. Uh, but all of these work pretty well. And the answer would be kind of what Dave was saying here is that you would test all of them. And one of the ways you can do that is just so you understand is you could right click this, duplicate, and then rename it. In other words, you could you could rename this XG boost, duplicate it and, and change it to CAT boost and they have four of them in a row here, all connected. And in the test and score, by the way, it will say what each one is. So if you have one says XG boost and one says cat boost, they'll be right here. That's the beauty of it. And again, another thing about this, so many software programs analyze one algorithm at a time. So it drives you crazy because 
you have to record the performance of that algorithm somewhere and then turn around and run another algorithm, record that and on and on and on. This is just so much cleaner and nicer. So we're not going to talk about the bells and whistles here. Just understand there are things that you can adjust and that's a little bit above what we're trying to do. So this is the CN2 rule thing. I'm not going to get into that part of it. Let's instead look at the rule viewer. And this is basically a lot of if then rules. Uh, you can look at some of them. You look over at probabilities. You could pick one. Here's a 90-10. If the chest pain's non-angina, the cholesterol is greater than 273, uh, that's actually saying it it's generally going to be no heart disease, uh, 90%. So you can look at some of these. And one of the things you can do is if you see one that's interesting, like here's a 90-10. Let's see, I think there's, well, here's a 90, sorry, here's a 95.5 where the gender is female and the slope is upsloping, not SD depression. Then chances are the diamond and narrowing is zero. But you, what you can do is you can highlight that what I've done, send it to a data table and you realize there's 47 women that fit that description. So that's another way to, to parse out your data, segment it. Uh, to, to an area, say, that's interesting. Like, I, I always think it's interesting is somebody has a reversible thallium, but yet has no coronary disease on coronary cath. Is that spasm? What is that? So that's just an example. But so that's the classification algorithms. We'll come back and look at the performance in a minute. And we can go ahead and look at the uh, regression real quickly also. So... Uh, I think, let me see why I use select columns. I think to get rid of the ID number, because if, if you're looking at numbers, there's no reason to have the ID number in there. This data set's looking at predicting, this came out of the data set widget to predict the uh, percent body fat, if you will. So we divided that again into uh, test, into training and test, if you will. A tree again, random forest, linear regression, and gradient boosting. So the real biggest difference is linear regression instead of logistic regression. But notice there's that regularization again, four different types, none, ridge, lasso. Elastic is a combination of ridge and lasso, but you need to experiment with each one. You never know which one's going to outperform. Uh, so I'm going to get back to this and notice the imbalanced data set. If I can remember to show you, that was the last thing that we can look at imbalance because that really is uh, an issue, if you will. It, it definitely affects things. If the class you're trying to predict is lopsided with not with usually not enough of the class you're trying to predict, in fact. Uh, okay, let me get back to the outline here, move my menu out of the way so I can see. There we go. Okay. All right, so I did give you articles on classification regression. Let's talk about the area under the receiver operator curve. That's the easy part. So you create a curve and you and it's the square area under here. Obviously, if this curve is up here towards the left, you're gonna have a high AUC or AUROC. One thing to try to logic out here is notice this is the true positive rate, which is sensitivity, and this is a false positive rate. In a, in a beautiful, perfect world, you'd want true positive to be way up here. You want them to all be true positive and you wanna have no false positives. So it'd be up around one. That essentially never happens. But let's go ahead and talk about though, uh, where did we get this curve? Because notice, first of all, it's jagged. Most of the time you see an image, it shows this beautiful round receiver operator curve. That's not re the real world because what this is, this curve is created by the true positive rate against the false positive rate at different thresholds. So this one is almost five, that's the default. So the model would spit out this for default. But again, you can shift this threshold. And I wanna show you what that means. In uh, this graphic, I think it really explains it well. 
This came from Amazon's machine learning university explain module where everything is interactive. This actually goes back to World War II, before your time, but not before mine, uh, where, and let's set the threshold at 0.5, the default, this actually happened. The, the origin of the receiver operator curve comes from a radar receiver operator who early on the radar wasn't very good. And they were trying to tell the difference between airplanes and clouds, signal versus noise. So take a look at this. Don't worry about numbers right now. Just look at the logic behind it. Okay, starting right here, you got a ton of airplanes on the right and a ton of airplanes on the left. You've got a ton of clouds on the left and a fair number of clouds on the right. Okay, you shift this over here. Now you've got nothing but, there are no false positives, you've got nothing but airplanes. But man, look at the number you left behind. So your sensitivity just dropped severely because you, you, you missed out on all these positives. But you no longer have any of the uh, clouds. You go the other extreme over here. You got one airplane. The rest of it's pure clouds. So the whole idea here is you can shift it and you can actually see what happens. And as a clinician, if you have an imbalanced data set, like I talked about, and I'll demonstrate, one of the techniques that we were not going to go over in detail is you can shift the threshold if it works in your favor, if it improves, let's say sensitivity is what you're after you can shift it. So let's just, so we're starting at 0.5. Let's go to 0.4 and see what happens. Let's start, well, let's start here and look. So true positive rates 0.57. We go this way and now it's 0.80. What happened to the false positive rate? It's got to go up because you now got all these clouds. So it is a little bit of a trade-off, if you will. And what happens, so you're looking at a true pipe 0.80 and 0.40. Let's go the opposite extreme to 0.6. Now your true positive rate dropped, but so did your false positive rate. But just play with this and it'll make, it'll start to make sense. But what if, think about it this way. So you record the output here, then you shift a couple of points over here and this is how you create the receiver operator curve with multiple different thresholds. You see the curve below it? Doesn't look exactly like a receiver operator curve, but that's what it is. All based on different thresholds, whereas the beginning one is 0.5. That's the gold standard. You, and you probably read half the books, you'll, they'll never mention that you can shift that or that's where the receiver operator curve actually came from. Okay, and so that this diagram just reinforces the shifting of the threshold. Okay, the confusion matrix. Another one I really like because once you do it, it's no longer confusing. So over here, and I had to pick two that were exactly the same with predicted on top, actual on the side. So again, predicted is one, in this case, heart disease, right? And the, the actual, the people with cardiac cats, this is one. So if it was predicted one and it is one, that's true positive. It predicted zero and it was zero, meaning no heart disease. That's true negative. If it predicted heart disease, but they didn't have it, false positive. If they predicted no heart disease, but they did have it, it's a false negative. And we'll see, we're going to pull up the confusion matrix in just a minute. Let me see how the time is going. We're doing fine. Uh, so here's an example, and I don't remember, this may be the heart, I think this is the training heart disease data set. I think that's 213 patients. But anyway, so true positive 73, true negative is 100, false positive 17, and uh, false negative is 23. And, and that's specifically for one algorithm, like logistic regression. So that's not all of them, that's one, a confusion matrix for one algorithm. But it's important for you to honestly open up the confusion matrix and look at these and go, okay, true positive, true negative, false positive, false negative, and get the hang of it. Why is it important? Well, that's how we calculate things. And it's very intuitive if you think about it. 
Sensitivity is true positive over true positive plus false negative. Why? A false negative is really positive. If you have a lot of false negatives, it's going to lower your sensitivity. By the same token, if you look at precision, that's true positive over true positive plus false positive. There's not really true positives, they're false positives. So if you have a bunch of false positives, that's going to lower your precision. Precision is also known as positive predictive value or PPV. Specificity is all about negatives. So that's true negative over true negative plus false positives. And so here's the false positive rate that calculated the x-axis of the receiver operator curve. Here's the negative predictive value. But the point here, you don't have to memorize this. I think some of it's intuitive, not all of it. But uh, notice that how important the confusion matrix is. I may have mentioned that I reviewed a medical article uh, a way back in... Uh, I just thought the results didn't make a lot of sense, but they included confusion matrix. And to make a long story short, they had sensitivity and specificity backwards. How did I know that? I calculated it from the confusion matrix. All right, F1 score, they call it harmonic mean. Just try to look at it as kind of, it basically takes into account precision and recall. And many times, that's what you really want to see. So an F1 score, particularly if your data set's in balance, often becomes what you're seeking. It's a good compromise, the F1 score. Accuracy is true positive and true negative over everything. Uh, often used, but again, make the point that AUC and accuracy are misleading, overly optimistic in the face of class imbalance, which I will show. Matthew's correlation coefficient is this, which I wouldn't expect you to calculate. Uh, there are online calculators for this, by the way. Uh, but it really measures the performance of both classes. And there could be times when you'd be interested in both. So the higher, the better. So if, you know, it's say 0.8, that's, that's a good model. Uh, but that's, a, that's the way to look at not just the, ma the majority class, but the minority class, look at both of them. All right, so let's talk about a little bit about the regression. And Dave, this is where if you want to intercede or interject, please feel free to do it. Uh, it's all about error measurements, mean absolute error. That means they take the actual error of, let's say, two points. If if the, uh, the real number is supposed to be four and it's six, the absolute error is two, right? So that's the mean error, if you will between the predictions and the true value. It's all about that error measure that I showed you under that simple uh, regression. Uh, less sensitive to outliers than the, the mean squared error. So how this is different is it squares the difference between predictions and true values. And it, it, it uh, is often used, uh, both are maybe reported in articles, thank God, with orange, all these are reported. And root mean square area uh, error basically is just the square root of the MSE. So they're definitely related, if you will. This is subject to outliers, uh, I might add. But another funny thing about it is when you take the square root of it, uh, the units you get will be the same as the target variable. So if this is the say the house prediction, cost of a house prediction data set, and the RMSE is uh, say 502, that's in dollars. In other words, it does match, uh, the, the error in dollars would match the outcome of the house in dollars, if that makes sense. Otherwise, the units are arbitrary. Uh, R square, remember the R value that I showed you in simple, uh, regression, if you square that, that's your R square. And I would look at it, I mean, the definition is proportion of variance explained by the model. I think it's just better to say, how well does the model fit that that regression? You know, how, how good is the model? The higher, the better. It, it'd be close to one, in other words. There are exceptions to this. Um, Dave, you have any ways to keep this simple, but expand on what I said? 
Yeah, it's 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 kind of just you know, like everything you said. I, I agree with it's it's uh, you know in the eye of the beholder, which which of these individual um, metrics do they believe is the most important? What's what's very interesting to see when you go on Kaggle, and I call that the the World Data Competition um, uh, Olympics, and very often. They'll say, "All right, we're going to we're going to base all of our prizes based on MAE, which is the first one on this list. They won't use R score. They won't use RSME. So again, it, 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 based on different people, will have different logic for what they believe makes sense for them. And that's always the problem with with anything in in orange and anything in any type of predictive analytics. All right." which of these metrics do you really want to believe? So you need to make sure that you, you make an intelligent decision on that. Okay, great. Scott? Yeah, I just want to add after F, G, I call it the Goldilocks phenomena. I mean, machine learning is like Goldilocks, the three bears. I mean, the bed's too hard, the bed's too soft. You got to find the just right. And that means you have to communicate with your team and you have to be available, I should say, open to tweaking, open to accept, accepting that you got the wrong thing. And it's just a constant iteration, which makes it fun, but is very different than just writing software. Well put. And let me shift this one back over where it belongs. Bob, you might want to mention maybe a little bit that we've also experimented with uh, taking the averages and uh, of, of a lot of these metrics to try to come up with a composite hybrid oh, metric. Yeah, I didn't mention that we should, that this was Dave's idea as usual. Uh, he basically said, well, look, we've got all these somewhat disparate measures. Why not sum them? Why not combine all of these and come up with a master score? And he did that in a spreadsheet that self-calculates. Uh, that's really pretty cool. And we've debated whether to publish it. One of the problems is what's the ground truth? In other words, Anytime you publish something and you're saying you got something better, what are you comparing it with? So it may make good intuitive sense, but I'm not sure what people would say about it. But it, it's a sum score, uh, which I think is great, you know, rather than relying on one, let's say just AUC, uh, you've got all these together. And, and again, I think that's a better way to go. Uh, I just moved this one over. It shouldn't be under regression, but it's really important. It's called no free lunch theorem. And it, there's different no free lunch, but in machine learning, it means, and I put this in quotes, there's no single algorithm or metric that universally outperforms all others across every possible problem. So to David's point about having so many combinations of algorithms that have been adjusted and you know tweaked uh that's how you're going to get the maximum score and dave when we go to the algorithms remind me to show them dynamic model optimization because i think that would be cool uh all right the last topic and we do have a data set to demonstrate that is it's very common in medicine and other fields to have the, the class of interest to be unfortunately the minority. In the Framingham data set, for instance, there's only 15% of people that in 10 years develop heart disease. That means 85% didn't. So what happens? The model learns on the majority uh, that don't have heart, that did not develop heart disease. And that skews the data, if you will. And think about it for a lot of other things as well. So what that does, and I hope you, you're going to get sensitized to it and look for it. When I see somebody's data now, that's one of the first things I look at. If the AUC and accuracy and specificity look pretty darn good, but the F1 score, recall, and precision are surprisingly low, chances are you've got class imbalance, okay? And we will demonstrate, though, that logistic regression and random forest do have an option to balance class distribution, which is basically giving more weight to the minority class to give it a better result, if you will. And that's, it is kosher. Please understand there are four or five other techniques uh, such as SMOTE. In fact, Dave and I uh, had a SMOTE widget made that doesn't exist in Orange. 
Uh, there is a Python widget, and we had a, a one of Dave's friends, a Python expert. He created a widget that will basically uh, help with data, uh, or help when you have class imbalance. But again, that's above the level of this class, and I really don't want to go there. I just to say hey, there are other techniques out there. So let's go back to our data set. Let's go back to the classification first. See where did it go? Did it go behind? Let me try that again. Okay. You all see the workflow, okay? Yes. Okay. So now let's count. Let's concentrate on the right side, test and score. Remember to always set your target as one. That's the out, always the outcome of interest is one. The other is going to be zero, if you will. But you can often, uh, this says average over classes. So there are going to be times when you might want to look at an average between the two, depending on what the clinical entity is. But by and large, the target's going to be one. Now, over here, if you want to look at the performance of the training data, you would click cross-validation. And the number of folds you can play with, five and 10 are popular. Remember what I said about stratified? Actually, I don't think I did. I think I skipped over and I apologize. The idea of stratified is... You want to be sure that in the folds that you created here, 10 folds, that you have the same percentage or proportion of uh, class one as class zero. So in other words, if you have, uh, in, in the case of Framingham, 15%, in every fold, that there'll be a 15% incidence of heart disease in there. That's what Stratified does, is keeps the folds with the same proportions. Now, this is the test on test data. So this is the one you're ultimately interested in. And so this is a balanced class uh, situation where you have about as many with heart disease as without heart disease. So because this is model discrimination, AUC is pretty much the gold standard. Interesting, and, and, and in this case, classification accuracy is pretty good too. And interestingly enough, notice that logistic regression has the best AUC and classification accuracy. And let's see, the F1 score is the highest, precision the highest, and recall the highest. So that's interesting. And the MCC is the highest. What is specificity? That's interesting too, that it's the best. So for whatever reason, and I don't know if that was done with or without regularization or whatever, but so for the, on the test data in this scenario, logistic regression is the winner. Any comment on that, Dave? Just to, I'm showing them only the test results. Yeah, you might just want to mention that you could uh, you could click on the topping and it'll automatically rank for your favorite metric and show you which one is the highest. Oh, you mean uh, sort it? Or yeah, sort sort by high. Let's say like F one or anything. Yeah, okay. So <laughs> yeah, if you wanted to sort by the highest, you these will sort. I should have mentioned that. So again, in this scenario, not in the training data necessarily, but in the test data, which are you're most interested in, uh, this outperforms. So that's a, an example again where a logistic regression was the winner in the clubhouse, even though it's by far the oldest. Uh, but that's a very clean data set, cleaner, nicer, neater than most data sets. And I think that's why. Uh, okay, so you can connect a bunch of stuff. We're not gonna connect a ton, but here's the receiver operator curve. Uh, target again should be one. And you can look at the different, uh, notice, I guess the, the CN rule thing performed the worst. Next worst, I guess, was tree. Logistic regression should be this orange up here, which performed best. But notice again, 
you have you don't have a million data points that is not a nice smooth curve. This is real world. Uh, and you can, by the way, if you want to highlight, let me try that again. Uh, let's just do logistic regression and that's what it looks like. All right, so the confusion matrix, uh, you can see again, uh, this is the test data. Let's look at logistic regression, since that was the best performer. Notice only two false positives, only six false negatives, so that's pretty good. Numbers are low here though, keep that in mind, because you've divided the data, in, so it's 25% of the total data, only 72 patients. So that's one of the problems uh, sometimes. And of course, it doesn't have to be 75-25. It could be 60-40, for instance. But uh, the nice thing is these are interactive too. If you said, I'm fascinated by false negatives, you could click that and send it to a data table or send it to save data, and you could study just these people. And that can be dynamic here. And I think we'll probably show that in a second. So here's the prediction when I wanted to talk about is so let's take the first two patients. The first one is a one and the second one's a zero. So let's go over to logistic regression. And so basically what it's saying is in terms of, let me broaden this a little bit. So in terms of predicting one, it predicted 0.87. And so the reciprocal is 0.12. This one, the next one was zero. So it predicted zero with this kind of certainty of 0.72, if you will. Uh, and and so it's, it's not going to be perfect prediction. It, as you look down here, you can see some are very close to one. Like here's a 0.97. Uh, but not, here's a 0.37. So it was off the mark here. No, so 0.37 and 0.62. So this particular prediction wasn't very good. But here is the probability, the actual probability. So that's the prediction widget, which is fairly unique. Okay, let's show, uh, let's see, David, how we're going to do. Let's do the dynamic thing we talked about. Let's, I need to shrink this way down. And let's take the logistic regression. Whoops. So it's set on lasso. Let's make it none, but let's look at what we're interested in. I think more than anything else would be the recall of 0 0.806. So let's change this to no regularization. Notice it dropped or did it go back up? <laughs> Let's try that again. Let's go to Ridge. I'm not sure why that went back up. Any thoughts on David? Let's try the gradient boosting because it, it it's showing a change, but then it reverts back to the original. So here's gradient boosting. And let's just look at, for instance, recalls 742. We can change the degree of regularization. And in fact, you can, if you click on it, you can hit your arrow buttons and move this to the right or left and dynamically see changes. Yeah, you can see if it pops up to the first place list just by moving it back and forth with your your arrow, right to left arrow cursor, and you could you could do some really fast uh, experiments in a very short period of time and find out, you know, are you going to be able to get this XG boost uh, to be a winner or not? 
Yeah, well, the idea that we found out is you could actually put up multiple tables here and looked at performance as you're tweaking things. So it's we call it dynamic model optimization. All right, so let's now look at the regression. This again is trying to predict the percent of body fat based on some local fat measurements, like abdominal. So I didn't cover uh, the MAPE, the P is percentage, but I'm gonna skip over that. You see MAE, root mean square error, MSE. And so again, this is on test data. And so let's see what has the highest R square. Looks like on the test data, random forest. What has the lowest MAE? Looks like also random forest, lowest root mean square error, also root also random for us. So for this particular data set, this particular in its own test data, it looks like random forest is the best predictor. And one of the things David showed me is you can also do a residual plot. And what that means is take a look at this. We said random force. So the outcome was the body fat measurement this Brozek is the, the technique to determine it. And we want to see how good a model random forest is. So random forest is on the Y axis and the real outcome is on the X axis. And you can get an R value of 0.85. So it's how well the regression model fits, in other words. And you can, again, tweak... Uh, random forest and see if you can improve on the R value. I'm not going to bother doing that, but I want to just say that's part of what's unique about orange is you can tweak that. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and skip down to the imbalanced data set real quickly. Only a few minutes for questions and comments. So this is, again, the Framingham data set of 4,240 people 10-year uh, risk of heart disease, so in other words, who did develop heart disease in 10 years, that's the outcome. Again, 15% did. I'm going to use logistic regression and random force for a reason. But number one, look at the results. AUC, it's not great, but it's not terrible either in terms of, say, random force. But when you look at the F1 and the precision and the recall, is pretty awful. And there, remember that the Matthews correlation co coefficient should be up close to 0 0.8, 0 0.9 would be great. Specificity uh, is okay for random force. So this is fairly typical of an imbalanced data set. Now this is, again, uh, I, that's on the training data. I didn't bother splitting it, but so that's what you're dealing with. So one of the things I was going to point out that you can do is you can click balance, well, actually I already did. So that was actually optimistic, believe it or not. So let's unclick it uh, for logistic regression and it'll deteriorate. It's still calculating. But basically it should get worse because you're no longer balancing it. So recall, look at it, what it is now, 0.78. So it, it suffered a great deal. Well, let's look at the confusion matrix and just for time purposes, let's only look at logistic regression. So let's look at logistic regression. So you have only 50 true positives. You've got 594 false negatives. So the model is not performing well at all. So let's go ahead and click balance class distribution. And then let's click on here. Now that is not. Yeah, it, ha it hasn't ca finished calculating yet. I didn't think so. All right, so you had 50 true positives. Now you have 430. You have more false positives, I might add fewer false negatives, but you do 
have more true positives here as a result of waiting. That's all I wanted to demonstrate. So in both random forest and logistic regression, you have the option to click balance class distribution. Okay. I'm sure everybody's exhausted. Hey, Bob, uh, does that balance make it 50 50 or what's the, what's the breakdown? If I've got 10%, 5%, I know what is your, what is your guess? Are you and Dave? I don't, I don't know the exact, I, I can't answer that specifically. It just adds weight uh, to that class statistically. Uh, Dave, any other input on the weighting? What's actually going under the hood happening? Yeah, it's it's uh, actually going to fifty percent, but it's 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 dealing with that with weights, and and it was what's always interesting in orange is you, you notice when Bob was clicking around, you're going to always get a warning warning sign that says you know if you if you balance the classes your performance may drop, so it doesn't always increase, but what it's trying to do is give you a realistic performance value, not necessarily the best, because if your data is very imbalanced. You might be thinking, oh, wow, I got a great model. But in reality, because it's so imbalanced, it's it's way too positive. Too optimistic is the word I mean. Yeah. So this, again, is giving you an introduction into basically data literacy and early model building. Uh, we didn't go any further. We really hope that you will dig further, take more courses, hopefully read our book or other books. Uh, also, try to learn as much about artificial intelligence as you can. Uh, please do look at the website. The classes that Dave set up, I think, are going to be extraordinary because uh, he's an extraordinary teacher. Uh, I'm going to hopefully stay in contact with many of you. I would like to work with any individual that wants to mine NHANES data for whatever purpose. Uh, would uh, consider possibly other workshops, but... At this point, I want to see kind of what happens in, in a, multiple directions. For instance, my own medical school is starting to contact me saying, hey, we're not doing anything in AI or data science. Help. So I don't know if I'll be busy with them. You know, who knows? But uh, I do appreciate your attendance and uh, patience and perseverance. This will be uh, obviously recorded and on our YouTube channel. We do appreciate you filling out the survey and staying in contact. And also, if you have any ideas, like the idea of CME, for instance, we'll look into. But other ideas, how this could be presented for other clinicians or non-clinicians uh, to make it as palatable and understandable as possible. We're all ears. You have both of our emails. Uh, any, any questions about what we said today or the last four weeks? Because I, I look forward to staying in communication with you all. Uh, you know, all of you all are coming with some interesting uh, experience in medicine and other fields. And I just think that, uh, you know, it's great that you're trying to learn more. Uh, th that's essential in today's world. I have if, a question. Yeah. What's your what's your recommendation of, let's say we you come up with a, simple but good model through your orange exploration and your model building and um it looks pretty tight and it looks like it actually could be deployed what would you recommend for actually the ml ops piece of that is the python underneath strong enough that i could get with a very facile python programmer at the hospital etc and, and let's just say i'm predicting clinic visit skips or something not you know terrible is 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 this enough of a launch pad underneath that we could get with somebody and actually move it to the next stage? Not commercialization, but deploy it. Well, I think my answer is remember the model can be saved as a pickle file, which is the Python model. So if you save the model, you can upload that, believe it or not. We had to work through a few glitches, but you can upload that to a notebook. So you actually can take a pickle file and create a new Python uh, notebook and go with that. So it goes into Jupyter and then share and we get you move on to the next step. You can. Perfect. Great. Thanks. 
And there are actually the other thing, by the way, that I was not aware of until I did just what you said, is there's a Python model uh, library that rather Orange Three. I'm not, I don't know too much about it, but th th there's literally a library, Orange 3. So I think when we did all that, I'd have to copy you, but I have an example of that in a notebook of how I did it, and it did work. Because what we wanted to do is be able to use Orange for a coding Kaggle competition where we could actually show we coded. <laughs> so the idea is we do all the groundwork and the dirty work in Orange, upload the model, and then take credit for a coding competition, which would be completely legitimate. So uh, and anyway, it can be done, but I think the pickle file is probably the answer. I was looking to build a recommender system and they pushed me toward Orange 3, so it does exist there. So I just learned about that this weekend. Yeah. So anyway, there are a lot of stuff out there. Uh, and, and again, we're just scratching the surface, but I. I think we've gone further than many, so I'm pretty proud of how much progress we've made. All right, if there are no other questions or comments, I wish everybody a wonderful Easter weekend and stay healthy and stay in touch. Thank you. Yes, okay. everybody, take care. Bye-bye. Bye now. <clears throat>